Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to thank everyone who managed to come down today. I know there were, it's nice out, and there was uh, some traffic problems with uh, a motorcycle run. But we don't want to waste a lot of time. We have a lot of information to cover, and much of it for people with diabetes, others with vision loss, is going to be the kind of information you can use in your day-to-day -day lives and give you a better understanding of the challenges you face and uh, some of the solutions, preventions, and detections for diabetes and specifically vision loss. I'm going to go slightly out of the ordinary here and start by thanking uh, people who were involved so that at the end we don't have to interfere with the Q&A if it's going very well. So uh, who needs to be thanked first? Uh, we have a community committee here in Medicine Hat that has really become active lately. They were integral in the organization and planning and presentation of this particular function. Uh, but probably first and foremost, the only reason we can even conduct this here today is through sponsorship by Novartis. Uh, without their participation, this kind of information, these kind of symposias that are being conducted around Alberta over the past few years are only possible with their participation. So our community committee members, uh, and I'm not including staff on this because they'll be recognized in a moment, uh, Wendy Johnson, Karen, uh, Karen Poitras, and Murray Hellam. Uh, Murray also had an article in the paper today uh, that might be of interest to you, and Murray will be speaking later on his particular uh, journey facing the challenges of diabetes and vision loss. Uh, I'd also like to thank the staff who came from Calgary today. Uh, we have uh, Barb Leg doing uh, low vision. Barb, if you can raise your hand just so people maybe know who you are. Uh, oh, right, from Lethbridge. It's been a long morning. Uh, we have Les Kwan, who's uh, our technology expert, uh, and he can show you some of the technology that is very useful to people with significant vision loss. He's in the room just off the left here after, uh, after this is over. Don't hesitate to pop in and see Les. We have Kathy Culhane, uh, who is uh, giving information and can provide you with some direction as far as independent living skills. Uh, and as well as orientation and mobility skills. Uh, Caroline Brown, I don't know if Caroline's in the room, but she is out there with a table, just giving you an indication of some of the consumer products that are out there that can be very useful in your day-to-day -day lives and meeting the challenges of vision loss. Uh, my brain has failed me momentarily. Uh, Medicine Hat staff who need to be thanked, of course, uh, Susan Stroschik, who I'm sure most of you know, and if you don't, uh, she is in the building. Uh, uh, I'm Bob Short. Uh, my position, I, I work out of the Lethbridge office, but I also travel back and forth here, and my position is client services and community development. Uh, we also have Helena Lake, it's never good to forget your boss, I almost did. Uh, uh, Helena Lake is uh, in charge of community partnership and what was the other part, Helena? Service and service quality. Now, I'm gonna roll right into the next part of our agenda, which is giving you a brief description of CNIB services. Uh, CNIB is a passionate group of in individual employees and volunteers and we provide programs and services to individuals who are partially sighted and blind to ensure that they can fully participate to the best of their abilities in Canadian life. So, some of our departments are, we have a children's department that deals with kids from basically zero through to the school years, and then they start working with our adult services. Uh, orientation and mobility, as I've already said, that can be anything from how to use a white cane, how to be a sighted guide, how to guide a person correctly. All of those come out of those areas. Independent living skills could be learning braille, could be uh, how do I cook properly in my house, how do I organize my kitchen, what's the best way to organize my clothes with significant vision loss, and that's all part of that. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned, our store out there with consumer products. 
Don't hesitate to grab a catalog. It'll give you an idea of some of the many solutions that are out there to some of the day-to-day -day things you, that you have to deal with when you're facing challenges of vision loss. One thing I, uh, I really want to touch base on here is, uh, is our programs and services are available generally free. Uh, if we're dealing with you as a client and you need some specific equipment to deal with the challenges you face, we always look at particular funding models and ensure that if you're fundable, that you're getting the funding you need and the equipment you need. Uh, one thing that's also important to mention here, I mentioned our community committee. Uh, this is a committee that is getting stronger all the time, but we are actively seeking individuals who want to participate with this committee to help move the agenda and the programs and services of the CNIB right here in Medicine Hat, to move those forward to ensure that we can continue to provide the individualized service that is so necessary for people with vision loss. As you can appreciate, uh, there are so many ways to lose your vision, so many different symptoms, so many different challenges that need to be faced. <clears throat> and that's why we take such an individual approach to meeting the challenges that each of you may have. How do you become a client? Give a phone call to our office here locally or our 1-800 line. Uh, business cards are out there. You can phone me anytime on my cell phone. I will give you direction on what's needed to become a client. If you are a client and you have questions, same thing. Please phone those numbers. Uh, we'd love to be able to call each of you once a year and say, how are things going? But the reality is, there are too many people with vision loss in the community for us to do that. And the second reality is it's anticipated potentially the numbers of people uh, that we deal with is going to double over the next 10 years, mainly due to age-related macular degeneration. But without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker. And I would have done them first and said thank you. Uh, Karen is also has helped us out with our community committee, but Karen Rogers is the representative for the Canadian Diabetes Association here in Medicine Hat, and she's going to tell you what you can expect if you need their programs and services, once again, to help you meet the challenges that you're facing from uh, diabetes. Uh, there are also a myriad of information on uh, lifestyle choices, etc., but Without any further ado, Karen, come on up. Do I need a ladder or would you like a hand? This is a big step up. <laughs> do I get a raise? You do. Hi, good afternoon everyone and welcome. I'm glad to see a lot of familiar faces here today. Thank you for coming. And first, I am the branch coordinator and have been at the uh, Canadian Diabetes Association. Um, I've been there for just about 20 years and it's coming up in April. I will be there 20 years. And um, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about the Diabetes Association and what we do on a daily basis. And our mission is to lead the fight against diabetes by helping people with diabetes live healthy lives while we work to find a cure. That's what I do every day, because I would love to see a cure. And we are the Canada's largest organization fighting against fighting for, di you know, against diabetes for a cure. And we do research with the causes, cures, and prevention of diabetes. Uh, we are supported in our efforts by a community-based network of volunteers, employees, healthcare professionals, researchers, and partners. We have summer camps for family and children ages 8 to 15. We have a resource center here in Medicine Hat, and it's at number 102. 73 7th Street Southeast, and our phone number, I can give it to you, it's 403-529-1259. We have educational webinars that you can view from your own computer at home. We do learning series programs, and we also do research programs. We support people with diabetes through advocacy. We have the Alberta Monitoring for Health program that supports your diabetes supplies. We have the Clothesline program that many of you might know about, and that toll-free number is 1-800-505-5525, and they will pick up clothing and small household items, and that money too goes to diabetes research. 
We have uh, also some of our programs that we have, we have Team Diabetes, which you can go and do marathons in several countries. I actually have participated and did three marathons myself and raised over $17,000 for diabetes. And I actually did two in Hawaii and I did one in Bermuda. But now they've got Cayman Islands, they've got many different ones and it's really hard to say, no, I can't do them anymore. <laughs> but my body just won't do it. <laughs> but I would do it if I could. And on November 1st, we will be lighting up the world's tallest teepee again this year. I started it last year, lighting it up in blue in celebration for International World Diabetes Day, and it's for diabetes awareness. So our, actually, our teepee here in Medicine Hat is being shown around the world with all the other thousands of monuments and buildings that are lit up in blue for diabetes awareness. So it was a real, um, just an emotional thing for me last year. I did apply for a grant and I am doing it again this year. So November 1st, if you want, come on out to the teepee. I'd love to see you out there and just feel the emotion uh, that you get when that teepee lights up in blue again for the whole month of November. Uh, the other thing that we, uh, I do on an annual basis, we do our residential campaign. So October 15th to November 15th is our a residential campaign, so someone will be knocking on your door and um, looking for a donation for diabetes. And that's another thing that we do on an annual basis. We also have a come and go tea October 14th for World Diabetes Day that we have at the office, and everyone is welcome just to stop in and see our office, see our resource center, visit with the people, and um, just come on out. We'd love to see you there. So. Um, Basically, I do all of the educational, I do all of the office. Um, I have a really big area that I do cover here in Medicine Hat. I also do all of the rural area as well. So I do keep busy and I'm a one person branch. So, and the rest is, I couldn't do it without my volunteers. My volunteers are my key people. They are the closest to my heart. So diabetes does affect people of all ages, so it's a widespread disease. And you, with people with type two, can control their diabetes. Type one, it's totally different. Insulin will control your diabetes. Okay, thank you very much. That's a big step. Uh, just before I uh, introduce our keynote speaker today, I would like to thank uh, a couple of other volunteers for CNIB. One is Norma Smith. Uh, she runs a peer support group called the Spectaculars. If you have any interest in that, what the group does is they meet monthly to discuss day-to-day -day approach to the issues and challenges of vision loss. We'll bring in speakers will do things like show people how to be a sighted guide and how to do it correctly and show people how to be guided correctly. So that may be of interest to you and there is a table out front. And I also wanted to thank our regular office volunteer who works with Susan uh, on a weekly basis and that's uh, Eleanor Moore. Uh, now with, uh, to keep the program moving along, uh, Dr. Ripon Chaudhry is a extremely well-known and respected ophthalmologist. You're fortunate to have him here in Medicine Hat. Uh, I'm sure many of you probably already uh, work with him. Uh, Dr. Chaudhry has, this is the second year in a row he's worked on a uh, symposia like this. The last one was macular degeneration. I think you'll find uh, that he delivers the message in such a way that it's very understandable even to us lay folks, and uh, I still get comments on how appreciative the information that he delivered in Lethbridge last year was to all of our clients. So, uh, if you can just uh, maybe give a welcome to Dr. Ripon Chaudhry. Thank you, Bob, for the kind words. 
Um, I, should, I should start by thanking um, and commending the CNIB and um, the Canadian Diabetes Association for organizing this. It takes a lot of work to do something like this, and, and it's nice uh, to see that it's being done. And um, I think see, I was surprised to find out how uh, CNIB fund, funding works, and they don't nearly have as much money as I thought they did. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot of work and, and stretching of resources to do something like this. To quickly follow up on the previous discussion, you know, th there is a lot of hope, just in terms of diabetes in general, because we, you know, we speak of how difficult it is, and, and, and um, but, but I, it, it behooves us to forget, to, to not forget where we come from, because, you know, a few decades ago, Banting and Best, two Canadians, uh, got a Nobel Prize for discovering um, insulin. And prior to that, diabetes was a completely different condition to what it is now, and of course, every decade, every year, we've uh, got better at dealing with it. But that's, we, we've come a long ways in the past few decades, um, and, and um, some of the people here were actually around, perhaps, when, when that had happened. Um, but to get to, to my talk here, I'm gonna try and briefly overview uh, diabetes before I do anything else, then how it affects different organ systems. Just to give you a flavor, feel free to ask any questions. Um, keep it reasonably uh, informal. Hopefully you can see all that, but um, point number one, uh, we have an obesity epidemic in North America. Only less than 50% of uh, Canadians have a, a body mass index, which we can discuss uh, later, if we, if we, a critical uh, measure of um, a body fat, which uh, gives, it's, it's a guide to uh, medical health overall, and it's something that really Everyone should be aware of their BMI these days because it's linked to all kinds of medical conditions. And it's a test that correlates very well with very fancy, expensive, uh, high-tech stuff, which is something that we can calculate for anyone in about 10 seconds. So less than 50% of Canadians are where they should be. 35% of Canadians have a BMI of 25 to 30, which puts them in the overweight category, and, and 15 and above 30, which is in the obese category, um, and all the health issues that come with it. So what is diabetes? Well, you know, in, in summary, the, the key problem with diabetes is, uh, as we know, insulin. There's two kinds, type one and type two. Type one, as we, all, as we know, it's typically the younger people that get uh, type one diabetes, and it is more complicated. Now there is actually other subdivisions, but in general terms, type one diabetes, what happens is uh, the pancreas, the, the beta cells in the pancreas are not producing insulin. That's really the bottom line, or not producing as much insulin as is needed. And really, it's an autoimmune condition where the pancreas have been affected um, and these beta cells have been affected by the body's own immune system and therefore not producing enough insulin. Insulin is what regulates blood sugars in the body. If you don't have enough insulin, blood sugars go up and all the subsequent damage that can happen uh, from there on. Type 1 is only less than 10% of uh, uh, folks with diabetes. So really, type 1 is one of those conditions where you, if you're unfortunate enough to get it, you have it. It has nothing really to do, for the most part, with lifestyle or anything else or the body mass index we talked about. The 10% of type 1 diabetes we just have to deal with and we can't, at the present time, uh, lifestyle-wise, uh, do anything prior to, to prevent it. Type 2 diabetes is really what we um, talk about more because more than 90% of uh, patients with diabetes are type 2. And here the problem part is a combination. Partly, the beta cells in the pancreas are not producing enough insulin, but just as, or even more importantly, we're realizing now, it's the fact that the tissues, all the tissues in the body, all the organs in the body are becoming resistant to insulin. So even if the insulin is there, they're not responding as they ought to, to the insulin. And this is related to a lot of lifestyle variables, including obesity. So, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, somewhat modifiable, preventable, we can do things to minimize risk. Um, and of course, it's a genetic link. Uh, the last statement there, uh, the Aboriginal population is a higher risk. There's other ethnicities that have a higher risk. Um, complications of diabetes, just to run down, I won't go through each of them other than to say it affects everything. Diabetes affect, and we'll talk about briefly why, but it affects every organ system from, you know, top to bottom. Um, and we're going to focus on, on vision, uh, of course, today, but um, it affects everything. 
the economic cost of diabetes, some of these numbers are actually old, um, uh, but really uh, this is from 98 uh, and it was over $5 billion US in Canada, the damage from the, the, the cost of diabetes. This number is easily more than double that. It, it very well could be more like triple that uh, today. And this kind of plays into, you know, what's, what's the benefit of prevention? How much, we talk about the cost of putting in programs to provide people uh, uh, with the appropriate help to take better care of themselves or take better uh, care of their diabetes and whether it be insulin pumps or what have you. You know, um, and there's a cost. That's what always gets mentioned. Well, this is the other side of the cost. You know, 10, 15 billion dollars that we, that diabetes costs us uh, purely in a dollar sense. So we actually would be a lot better off spending the money up front and preventing a lot of the problems and keeping people healthy. Cardiovascular, heart and stroke risk, of course, is one of the key um, costs there. To manage diabetes, uh, you know, the, the three critical components, patients being the most important ones, and then you have the doctors and then you have the other allied health professionals. It's nice to see now the way the model is going in Alberta, at least, where you have the um, uh, most family doc clinics now have a diabetic nurse, you have a, a you know, dietitian, and all working together makes a huge, uh, huge impact on that. And I've personally, I mean, uh, some people in the room here, we've talked about stories with how much it's helped um, uh, people maintain, maintain better uh, blood sugars. It, it requires a multidisciplinary approach is, is the bottom line, uh, and that's not me with a needle. <laughs> um, I'll skip through. I um, wanted to briefly go over this slide, and, and hopefully it's, it's reasonably um, focused up there, but we talk about we talk about um, all the different ways it can affect a person and vision in particular, but vision is actually also in its own right a very complex thing. What we're talking about is light getting to the eye, and we call this the diopteric system, light being converted into an image and sent back to the brain, different parts of the brain, which the names are there but I won't bother you with, and then it goes through different pathways and ends up in the back part here in the occipital lobe. Didn't mean to do that. Um, and that there. Um, this is where the vision is processed, and then it goes to different areas. Just saw a patient yesterday, for instance, where this all works. Go, the, the signal goes back there, so you, if you test, you can actually tell that the person can see, but they cannot perceive that they can see. So there's a, it's the first, we're mostly focusing today on damage to the eye, damage to the retina, so the person can't see, but really damage from diabetes happens not just there, but further back in the brain, uh, as well, which causes vision and other problems. So uh, just a couple of quick numbers. After 15 years of diabetes, 2% uh, of the affected people um, uh, may become blind. That's just the statistical number. And so that gives you an idea, you know, one in 50 people with diabetes after 15 years of diabetes um, will go blind if we, you know, unless we really are trying to stay on top of things and, and run the system better. 10% uh, develop a significant visual handicap. 2% blind, 10% with a significant visual handicap, although not to the uh, level of blindness. Diabetes is the leading cause of blindness and vision loss in people under the age of 75. You know, not much else to be said. That's pretty self-evident, uh, the importance. Um, Important uh, risk factors that uh, must be mentioned, smoking is absolutely critical. I mean, the amount of time I uh, spend uh, discussing smoking with my patients, uh, or not smoking perhaps. Um, and then blood pressure um, and, and other things such as kidney function, obesity, diet, cholesterol levels are, are absolutely critical um, to um, maximizing your diabetic control and, and, and uh, minimizing the chance of having, having problems. Eye disease is potentially preventable and treatable, and I, I, this I really like to stress because um, it is not inevitable that after a certain amount of having diabetes, a certain amount of time of having diabetes, that a person is going to lose vision or go blind. That is absolutely not true. Yes, statistically, some people probably will get in trouble, but we can absolutely make a huge difference in decreasing the percentage of people that get to that point, uh, both, again, from what I do, what the dietitian does, the family doc, and the, most importantly, the patient. Diabetes affects all aspects of the ocular system, uh, so it's not just one part or the other. Um, everything in the eye is affected by diabetes. 
and this is just a quick drawing to show that, um, you know, just a quick schematic of the eye. But if you, if you look here from the cornea, aqueous chamber, iris, lens in the eye, which is what gets hazy in a cataract and gets replaced in cataract surgery, the vitreous cavity, the retina lining the back wall of the eye, which is really where I spend most of my time and, and is responsible for uh, most of the blinding eye conditions, uh, uh, including uh, diabetes. Uh, the damage happens in the retina and the optic nerve, uh, which takes the signal back to the brain. And I'll skip through that. This is just the labeling of the parts, so we won't bother. Uh, I, had, uh, I had made a, a list of how, uh, again, I'm not going to go through all of this, of course, but just to see, just to, just to demonstrate that every, uh, every sub-organ system from the cornea in the front to the retina and the optic nerve in the back is affected by diabetes. Uh, kind of to repeat what I just said, there's more detail there, but we don't need to um, bother with that right now. Uh, the cornea... It, 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 and again, I, I won't uh, dwell on that, but it affects the clear window in the front of the eye in, in ways that can potentially lead to vision loss. Uh, although, to be fair, this is still a relatively minor complication of diabetes relative to what happens in the back of the eye. And I'm going to skip by that. Um, this is interesting. I, I, this was interesting just because I wanted to uh, show how you know, we live in a technological age, and it's very neat how work that NASA's doing in space is relevant to some of the things, uh, what we do in the eye. So there is, um, I think that's actually the next slide, but using spectroscopy and some of the techniques they use to, to study stars and ast astronomy and astrophysics, use, applying that technology now, there's new ways to actually test blood sugar levels from the eye. Um, the aqueous chamber, the clear window I, I had pointed out in the front of the eye, uh, without actually putting any needles in a person or anything, you can just test a person's blood sugar levels. And actually, there's evidence that that's actually quite an accurate reading. This is a field of ongoing research. Um, but that comes from work that, uh, that NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab does in, in uh, Pasadena. So it's pretty neat how these things come together. This slide was simply to show that uh, there's a very good correlation between actual blood sugar levels and your sugar levels as they're tested. Uh, from your eye, just practically just by shining a light at it. And now this is, of course, all in the research realm yet. It's not practically uh, clinically relevant, but uh, that's how these things start. Diabetic changes in the iris. The iris is the colored part of the eye, and I won't, again, uh, dwell on this too much. I've got so many slides I can talk for hours. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm skipping by a lot of this stuff. Um, the iris can uh, cause two kinds of problems. It can give you severe glaucoma. Uh, by damage from, from diabetes. And um, the other problem is it can give you new blood vessels that form on the iris, uh, which has its own uh, set of issues. Uh, but I'm moving front to back. So we talked about the cornea and the iris. Uh, this is an angiogram. This is an interesting test. Uh, uh, and I know some people in the room here have had an angiogram with me. Um, this is a normal angiogram. If you look at the eye, if you look around here, uh, this is the pupil a dilated pupil with drops, and this is the margin of the iris, and there is no leaking, it's all dark. This, I'll show you uh, a patient with a eye with diabetic complications. You see how there is white stuff here, and most importantly, white stuff, it looks like it's not very much, it's just a little bit of white at the rim, it's leaking a fluorescein, and then I won't go into any detail of what the technology, how that's working, but this little change, this little change in this test is highly indicative of this person needing aggressive, urgent treatment. Otherwise, we're looking at a far greater than 50% risk of blindness in the coming six months. Just this one little. So you have to look closely, uh, but if it, today we have the technology to try and modify the risk by catching things as early as possible. Mind you, this would not be categorized as catching it early. It should never have got to this point. Normal vision, early stage glaucoma, mid stage glaucoma, late stage glaucoma. So, you know, um, glaucoma is a separate condition in its own right, just to be very clear. Diabetic related complications and glaucoma are completely separate. Most people with glaucoma have no diabetes. 
uh, glaucoma is basically high pressure in the eye causing damage to the optic nerve and vision loss over time. Glaucoma, uh, because of diabetes, is a separate deal. So we're now just talking about glaucoma can be caused by diabetes as well and give you problems such as that. Um, in the lens in the eye, you can have uh, basically, and I won't go into the details, but the lens in the eye, just like a camera, the eye has a lens. It gets hazy over time. That's a cataract. Uh, most people eventually would need cataract surgery, but uh, the biggest risk factor of cataract surgery is just, you know, be, uh, it's age-related. But diabetes is the other leading cause why, uh, particularly people at a younger age, uh, might need cataract surgery, and the lens gets opacified, and all of this gets opacified here. Uh, this is a cross-section of the lens. In diabetes, if you have significant fluctuation of your blood sugar levels up and down, which we try to, that's, that's what we try to modify and not let happen. Um, initially, the, step one is that you become more short-sighted. And as the blood sugars fluctuate, your vision is going to fluctuate, day to day, that sort of thing. Over time, that's going to result in... Um, Basically, let's call it hydration of the lens. The lens gets full of water and sugary substances and sorbitol and, and, and things like this. And then when that happens, you become more short-sighted. So all of a sudden, your glasses aren't working for you. So we have this often, I have this discussion with patients, don't go and just get a new pair of glasses because you can and you will be able to see better, except as your sugars change a few weeks down the road, those new glasses are gonna be no good anymore because your focusing is changing. We need to get the sugars down, that's the problem. That's stage one. Stage two is if you let this happen for a long enough period of time in the lens, it's not just that you're going to get more short-sighted uh, and the focusing of the lens is going to change, you will get a cataract. Uh, the lens will literally become opacified and cloudy and hazy instead of being clear, and you need cataract surgery at that point, which is more complicated in eyes with diabetes than standard cataract surgery, I should stress. Um, the cataract risk is two to four times higher in um, patients with diabetes, and patients younger than 40, it's 15 to 25 times higher. So, you know, much, much higher rate of, um, of uh, cataracts in younger patients with diabetes. Um, this, I wanted to have this slide just to, you know, everyone uh, or should, at least does or should know what the hemoglobin A1C is. I know my patients and I talk about this when, when I see them. It's the three-month average. So what is that three-month average? Why does that number, why do we ha you know, give so much importance to that one number? Well, the reason is, it's actually the, interesting how the body works. The hemoglobin that carries oxygen in blood, it, it, it lives in the red blood cells. The hemoglobin typically does, has a very small percentage of the hemoglobin that has a glucose molecule attached to it. Now, if you can imagine, in diabetes, your glucose in the blood running around is very high. See, when you have that much glucose, get stuck to more of the hemoglobin molecules because there's so much of it, it's just getting stuck to a whole bunch more hemoglobin molecules. So that one test is simply a measure of what percentage of the hemoglobin, the red blood cells in your body, have glucose attached to it. The reason it's a three month is because it's interesting the way it works out, the red blood cell has a lifetime of 90 days. After 90 days, that red blood cell is taken out of the circulation and gotten rid of and a new one's produced in its place. So if you keep checking it, you know for the last 90 days, because all the blood cells we have now were produced in the last 90 days. The ones prior to that are gone. So but with that one test, it's, this is the basis of that test where you can actually tell how your diabetic control has been for the last 90 days, because you can check what percentage of red blood cells have glucose attached to it. Uh, and you know it's accurate because these blood cells didn't exist prior to 90 days. Um, that's enough detail there. Just a few um, pictures. That's a cortical cataract, and uh, you know there's different parts to the lens, as uh, that uh, drawing had shown. And um, cortex is what is starting to get opacified here. And white. This is a little bit more advanced. This is a little more advanced yet. Now in this situation. Um, this person has extremely, extremely hazy vision. Uh, in all likelihood, legally blindness level vision. Uh, um, so cataract surgery is um, needed here um, relatively quickly. This is even one stage progressed from that. And I'm just showing you cataracts. So when I'm looking at the back of the eye, trying to treat the retina, um, when you have a cataract like that in diabetes, it makes it very difficult for me to be able to do what I need to do to keep the 
machinery in the back of the eye working because my view is highly impaired by this cataract. This is the view looking through a cataract. I saw I'm looking at the retina here. It's kind of a, just a hazy blur, and it's not just because of the projection. That is what it is. It, this yellow thing, circle here is the optic nerve. These are retinal blood vessels you can barely see, but it's all hazy because I'm looking through a cataract here. And then if you go in comparison, this is a normal red. This is what I should be seeing when I look in the back of the eye. Now, you can, you can treat stuff going on here, but you'd be hard-pressed to do too much uh, with this kind of view uh, to, to treat the back of the eye. And I'll just, uh, a different kind of cataract. Um, so how do cataracts affect vision? Well, light falls in the eye. Um, this is how we see uh, the cornea firstly in the front of the eye and then the lens here. They focus the light back on the retina and the center of the retina, specifically called the macula, the most important part, and that's, that's what allows us to see. If this is hazy and not focusing light, of course, you can't, uh, you can't focus it and you won't see. So this is what someone with a cataract might see. Uh, then you can see the effect glare. People will often describe glare from cataracts. And as the cataract progresses, the glare around lights continues to get worse and worse. Um, this is, I won't go into the details, but this is one particular patient um, who demonstrated fluctuation of blood sugar levels. And when you map the blood sugar levels for this lady over the course of a year, and then map on top of that how the vision was, it's actually very interesting because it maps perfectly. Whenever the sugars were off, the vision was off. Whenever the sugars were better, the vision improved. And as uh, we well know, uh, after Christmas, there was a bump downwards uh, that took a while, a month or two, and then things settled down again. Um, and this is the, the, the graph that shows that, how you have a fluctuation in sugar, and then you, she got better, and then she started to get a little bit, a little bit relaxed again on her sugar control. Um, and this just... Uh, I'll, I'm skipping by. This talks about what a normal refractive change should be. It should be more stable. Um, you know, if it's just change because every year a person's glasses are changing a little bit, a bit of aging change, let's call it, it should be more of a stable line like that, the dotted lines. It should not be doing what this is doing. This is caused specifically by the blood sugar. Um, you can have changes in the vitreous jelly in the back of the eye from diabetes. And this is, again, normal retina, uh, the optic nerve, uh, retinal blood vessels, the very center of the retina, the macula. And here you have uh, someone with um, these shiny uh, objects floating around. These are actually calcium phosphate salts, and you can see them here uh, shimmering. And if you shine a light at them, they literally do shimmer back at you. Um, it's quite a dramatic appearance. Di eyes with diabetes, patients with diabetes have more of this. This is a finding that looks very dramatic. Thankfully, is one that does not often have too much um, visual significance. Bob, do you know how I'm doing for time? Uh, Ten. Ten. Perfect. Um, so now I'm kind of, now that I, the reason I want to ask you was, because this is really the, the meat of the matter. Uh, and, and in the end, you know, you have to rely on the physician to, to diagnose it and catch it. But it's, it's good if the person knows why, you know, they're having trouble with the vision, why they're getting laser treatments or, uh, you know, these medications injected in the eye and things of this nature. Um, so diabetes, how it does damage to the back of the eye, to the retina, proceeds on two parallel tracks. One is you go from having no problems to bleeding starting to happen, leaking starting to happen, new blood vessels starting to grow where they shouldn't like weeds and causing problems and eventually to the point of blindness. The other track is simply swelling in the very center of the retina and the macula with leaking of fluid which can happen at an early stage, moderate stage or late stage. So the macular swelling and macular edema we call it um, you treat whenever it happens, but it could happen at any stage. The other is really the irreversible part where you go from mild to moderate to severe disease. That only goes one way. That's more an indication of 
how long you've had diabetes, what kind of control you've had of your diabetes. Macular edema also is, of course, affected by your sugar control and your blood pressure control and these things. Um, uh, but again, you could have macular edema early on without having too much other uh, diabetic complications. So um, why, th this, this is interesting, not just in the eye, but why does or how does diabetes cause harm to all these organs? Why is it that your eye and your heart and you know, peripheral nerves and your kidneys being affected by diabetes, what's the common factor? Because there has to be, of course, it's not doing it in some independent different ways. Diabetes just does, in a way of speaking, one key harm to the body, and that's the basis of why all the rest of it happens in the eyes and the heart and everything else. And basically, what that is, is it harms the small blood vessels. The body has, you know, big blood vessels going out of your heart, and then they get smaller and smaller to the point of being microscopic, going to every organ system where literally each cell of the body, which is a hundredth of a millimeter, is getting oxygen and blood flow delivered to it. Those small blood vessels are the ones that are damaged by diabetes. Big blood vessels are what's damaged when you hear of someone having a blocked artery in the heart and they do a bypass. Well, that's actually, in a way of speaking, more straightforward because you do an angiogram, you see which blood vessel is plugged up, and you bypass it. The problem with diabetes is that it's affecting millions and millions of small blood vessels in the body where there is no way to just go in there and replace these or bypass them. So it's a much more complex problem, um, and it's doing it all over. And so the way it does it is, um, uh, let me just go back here. The small, again, without going into maybe too much detail perhaps, but these small blood vessels are run by something called endothelial cells and pericytes. And these pericytes are basically at the very, very smallest of the blood vessels, the capillaries, have these pericytes. These are particular cells that are responsible for maintaining the health of the blood vessel. If you damage them, the blood vessel gets occluded, plugged up, leaky, bleeds. Um, bleeding and leaking and all of that happens first. Eventually, there's so much damage, that little blood vessel just gets plugged up. As you might imagine, if you plug a blood vessel up, it was there for a reason. It was supposed to take oxygen and blood to wherever it was going to, whatever, whichever cells and whichever organ. Once you've plugged it up, that organ is no longer getting the appropriate blood and oxygen and you're gonna have damage. And that's the bottom line. That's why, how it does damage the kidneys, the heart, and the eyes, and everything else. The reason we see, and I'll, I'll actually just skip forward here to show you, this is a, a pericyte in a normal person. You get nice pericytes here, you know, plump, and they're regularly lined up, whereas here, you can barely see them. They're basically just shells, they're gone, and this is damaged because of diabetes. And this blood vessel pretty much is going to be, at this point, pretty shortly useless um, to wherever, whatever part of the body it's supplying oxygen and blood to. Um, diabetic retinopathy, damage to the retina in the back of the eye from diabetes. Um, the reason the, the, the retina it gets talked about more, quite a bit relative to other organ systems in diabetes is because damage to the retina happens before it happens anywhere else, in a statistically general way of speaking. The reason for that is, Weight for weight, the retina is the hardest working part of the body. It, it uses more blood, more oxygen, um, and, and metabolically, it's, it's churning out. I mean, it's working at 100% capacity. Vision takes a lot of resources. If you start thinking about how complicated vision is, that moment to moment we're looking around, we, you know, we make cameras that take pictures that are, you know, uh, 10, 12, 15 megapixels. We think that's a great thing because, and these are still photos. The eye is constantly in three dimensions providing a signal to the brain that's being processed constantly by us and keeping the signal together, keeping the focusing no matter where we look. It is an incredible, so the one, uh, I mean, to me, of course, it's incredible because I I, I'm a little biased as well, but 50% um, of the brain at any given time is processing vision. That's how much, so half the brain at any given time, metabolic activity-wise, is simply devoted to vision. The other half is doing everything else. So that tells you how complicated the system is. And when you start to do damage of the sort we talked about to the small blood vessels um, and basically shut down gradually the tap of the blood flow and the oxygen and the nutrients, the organ that's working the hardest is going to start to suffer the first and show you damage first. And that's why the retina shows it first. Then the kidneys and the heart starts to come afterwards. So in a way, it's a leading indicator. The, the, um, and then, you know, I, some of my patients are aware 
if I see enough of a concern, I let their internist know. I, you know, I call Dr. Azam or their family doctor because what that tells me is we're going to start to see problems in the, in the kidney. We're going to start to see problems in the heart. It is not an isolated thing. So now to jump forward to the eye, which I'm supposed to talk about. Um, this is um, the way, the, the different stages uh, where, and we have categorization for these things, and which, which are no, of no relevance to a general discussion. But um, you have microaneurysms in the retina where these weakened blood vessels start to um, uh, bulge out, turn into an aneurysm, the leak and bleed. We treat those with lasers. Um, Interretinal hemorrhages, nerve fiber layer infarct. Infarct is simply heart attack is a myocardial infarction. So infarct is simply uh, any organ system of the body having um, uh, you know uh, loss because of lack of blood flow and oxygen. Um, and so you have infarctions in the retina. Uh, exudation is leakage of protein and fat. Neovascularization is the most severe stage uh, where you have new blood vessels growing. What happens there is. Um, the, 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 you know, nature has the right idea where when all of the damage happens to the blood vessels, what, what's the solution? Well, you know, nature has figured out the initial part of the solution, which is that why don't we produce a substance which is going to cause the body to form new blood vessels? Because after, after all, if you think about it, we formed those blood vessels at some point when we were, uh, you know, very early on um, uh, prior to being born. Um, we were forming these blood vessels in the retina. In fact, they're not all formed when you're born. That's why some of the premature babies run in trouble uh, uh, that, that we see. Um, uh, um, and so these blood vessels were formed in the first place. So what the body does is it turns on the tap on the few things, one main thing, um, kind of molecular substance, that caused these new blood vessels to form at the time. So then, well, let's form new ones to replace these damaged ones from diabetes. Sounds like a great idea, and then we get more blood flow and, and oxygen. Unfortunately, it doesn't work well, because the new blood vessels do form, but they're of no use. They form at the wrong place. They're just abnormal. They grow like weeds. Um, they bleed, and they really don't solve the problem. So in a way, the Nature's kind of got an attempt at fixing the problem, but it all goes haywire and in the end causes, uh, in fact, much more problem. Um, briefly, these are the little microaneurysms that I mentioned you can start having and you treat them with laser if they're near the center of the vision. Some of these things, this is just to show you, know, some of these things are pretty subtle, so you need to look uh, pretty closely. Um, these are more obvious interretinal hemorrhages. Um, this here w would be a nerve fiber layer infarct. I talked about um, uh, uh, infarct simply being loss of or damage to the, to the tissue from lack of blood flow. So this would be equivalent to your little heart attack in the, in the retina. And this is neovascularization, the blood vessels that grow like weeds, the abnormal ones. Now, if you, think, if, you know, if you look at it, it doesn't look all that dramatic, but this little squiggly stuff here is all it is. And this I now, um, and I keep saying I, uh, because that's how we're talking about two different eyes in people. Uh, I hate to say it like that because ultimately you're talking about this patient, but, but this eye in this patient um, has a risk of um, significantly over 25% of going blind in one year. And, and that's an understatement. It's actually higher than that given the amount of uh, new vascularization there is if you didn't do anything. So that's, that's the uh, you know, uh, significance of that little change there. I think I might just um, skip by. I've, I've, I've conveyed most of um, what I wanted to, I think. This one, this would be an early stage of diabetes. Uh, you can clearly see you know, some hemorrhages here and there. Uh, and this would be mild to moderate uh, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, you have another photo of the same thing. Um, th this is just purely for, out of, out of uh, uh, curiosity that not all things look, not all things that look similar are the same thing. This is a very similar kind of change here, a little bit of hemorrhaging here. This is from blood uh, hypertension. This is from blood pressure. This is not diabetes change, and there are subtle differences. And, and uh, so other things will do similar things. It's not just diabetes. There's a lot of times you see stuff like that happening in, in a patient's eye, uh, but it's not always diabetes. So this is a normal retina and macula that I described. This is the macula. The, the point I wanted to, um, I'm going to actually go back. The point I wanted to make here is this is a very small part of the body. If you, if you really, 
it comes down to preserving the macula in terms of preserving vision at the end of the day. And in that sense, most of what I do um, day in and day out, I basically live in half a millimeter of the body. Like that's all I do is half a millimeter uh, is the size of this whole thing which determines whether we see or not. So it's, it's pretty neat how the, even within the retina, all the important key stuff is focused right at the very center. The reason it actually is, by the way, is why not make that area bigger in terms of nature? Well, why not make that area bigger and then we have supervision? The reason is it takes so much of the brain already to process data from that little area. If you made that bigger, we simply don't have the capacity to be able to do all that. So um, that little area is what provides um, us with our central vision and sharp focused vision. And I'm going to kind of skip by that made the point. The retina, we talk about the retina like it's a wallpaper in the back wall of the eye. In reality, it does, it's a very complex, it's part of the brain, firstly, I should say, the way embryologically it grows is the brain grows into the back of the eyeball and the optic nerve and the retina form in that fashion. So really, it is part of the central nervous system. And um, that's why retinal transplants and things, sometimes, you know, patients would ask. Um, unfortunately, we're nowhere near anything like that because it's not like transplanting a knee. It's, it's, um, it's like it's brain tissue, and we just it's very complex tissue uh, to replicate. And the retina has 11 different microscopic layers, and this is just to demonstrate that you know light comes here, it goes all the way down, and then each stage there's complex crosstalk between cells, and there's back and forth. And relative to what computers do, what's happening here is far, far more, more complex in such a small layer um, uh, in terms of the amount of processing that's happening. And that's why we can't replicate it with computers. I'm going to try and finish here. Uh, this is just to, just to uh, demonstrate that it's fluid and blood leaking into the retina that starts a lot of the problems um, that then lead to some of the things we, we talked about. These are some just images of, of um, eyes with diabetic damage. This CSME stands for clinically significant macular edema. This macula here, uh, this is again the optic nerve, this is the macula, the center of the retina. All this yellow stuff is fat and protein. A lot of the patients in whom we're treating with injections or, or, or laser and stuff, that's what the macula looks like. And if you looked at it in cross-section, I'll show you on, a, on an OCT scan, instead of being thin, it's thick and full with blood and fluid and fatty tissue and protein. Uh, so that's, actually I'll go back. In terms of an angiogram, that's a normal angiogram test. The macula should be nice and dark, just pristine. That's just a beautiful looking macula. If you go to uh, mac someone with macular edema, this doesn't even look like it. This is the very center. That was nice and dark. It just leaking fluorescein all, uh, all over, all around. And this is the little yellow optic nerve, by the way. And this is the problem. I mean, this is severe macular edema. Uh, this is what it looks like clinically, but you can see how dramatic it is in the angiogram test. And um, this person, now OCT scan is just a cross section, like a fine high resolution, and most of my patients know what it is, they have this test quite frequently. Um, it's a high resolution microscopic kind of, um, almost call it a CAT scan, except it's not done with radiation uh, off the retina. This is nice and thin macula, nice dip in the middle, what we call this the foveal contour. That's how it should be, and these images aren't, aren't the best, but this would be a, a patient before treatment. All of these black, so it should be like that, nice and thin, it's all thickened up with blood and fluid, and this hill here is causing, this person might have vision that's, uh, you know, uh, reduced to halfway to legal blindness level if you were to just generally uh, uh, talk about where, where this macula might be. And then you treat, and then you can see that the macula is restored, it's uh, foveal contour, the macula is generally dry, and not everything works quite so straight in a straightforward forward fashion, but we have things we can do to, to do this. Now, the fluorescein angiogram test, these are just some uh, subtle images. I'm going to go to my conclusion slide.
Diabetic macular edema is, um, is basically um, the swelling and, and um, bleeding in the center of the retina, and this is to be differentiated from macular degeneration, by the way, which is a separate condition. It just affects the macula. This is because of diabetes. Macular degeneration has nothing to do with diabetes, uh, although the symptoms are similar, such as um, this is normal vision. This is what someone with macular edema might see. The center is all gone, so wherever they're, they're looking, uh, the center is blurry. Some more dramatic images, which uh, I think um, gone over generally what. Maybe I'll just briefly go. So this person, uh, this is um, without treatment. So this, this eye, this patient, uh, initially the eye looks like that. This is some laser treatment that's been previously done. There's a little abnormal blood vessels growing still despite the treatment. Um, the diabetes drive is strong enough that it's overcome the treatment effect and these new blood vessels are still growing like weeds so you need to do something more. Uh, but in any case, this person uh, didn't want treatment so, we, so it continued and there's more happening here. You can see these new blood vessels that are growing like little wisps. Um, and um, then you um, end up with this, so they bled, and then you have a little more blood, and then, then it ends up at some point with scarred down retinal detachment, which just is a bunch of scar tissue, and, and um, the eye is basically full of blood at that point. You can't really see anything, and that person would have no vision there. I uh, shouldn't ever get to that point. Um, I think I've, I've um, stressed enough the importance of diabetic control and, and uh, uh, the fact that significant percentage of patients with diabetes will have vision problems unless, you know, most importantly, uh, uh, control is maintained as well as possible. And then, of course, treatment as and when uh, needed. This is normal vision. This is vision when you have a vitreous hemorrhage. I think I have a quick cartoon coming up, and then I'm going to stop. The, the, basically, you know, I've only focused on some things, but um, diabetes can do anything, including affecting the nerves in the, that control the eyeball, the muscles that control the eyeball. So double vision is, is one of them as well, and there are specific kinds of entities that we diagnose in people who have double vision. So... In conclusion, diabetes affects all parts of the eye, and we're now talking only about the eye. The key areas are in the back, in the retina, um, and unless you control things on time, you could have irreversible vision loss, so the key is to, to get, catch it early. Uh, this is preventable and treatable, that's, that's the other uh, uh, message. And screen, 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 the last a little bit here, any, everyone with diabetes, um, I don't know why I'm pointing to my computer screen, but here, anyone with diabetes at the very least should be seen by an optometrist for their eyes uh, once a year and go on to myself or, or otherwise if more is needed, but at least be seen once a year by their optometrist. Um, family doctor, internist, you know, dietitian, diabetic nurses, everyone should be, uh, should be involved. And this is for the most part vision. We're not even talking about all the other organ systems in any detail uh, that diabetes can affect. So thank you, and um, I'll answer any questions anyone might have. And just uh, briefly before we go into our Q&A, which you'll have an opportunity to ask Dr. Chaudhry and the panel a couple of questions, uh, Murray Hellam is just going to do a brief presentation and let you know what his journey's been like as somebody with uh, diabetes and significant vision loss. And Murray, I'm going to bring a mic to you if you want to stand.
as you can tell, there's two people up here, or two things, and Murray's the co-star now. <laughs> Oh, I don't know where to begin. Um, <clears throat> it's been a road, all right. Um, uh, there's been a lot of people in my life that have guided me, but I always thought that I didn't need their help. I wouldn't take their help. Um, about 10 years ago, things really hit. Um, I had to have a lot of treatments to my eyes, just that. And the, the recovery from the treatments were just devastating. It, it took two weeks of each treatment, and I had about 40 treatments that I had to sit around and do nothing, and that was just too long for me to sit. Um, and then, I don't know, it, I, nothing clicked in yet at that time. I was too busy being the boss. Or, being in charge of myself, not letting anybody tell me what to do. I'm very stubborn and willing to get done whatever has to be done at that time. But about uh, eight years ago, they, they kept finding me behind the steering wheel of my truck, unconscious, and they're out in the tractor, out in the field, unconscious in the hay field. So the doctors told me that I had to move into town, and that was a big kick. Finally, about that time, I realized I had to let go of the reins and start accepting the help that I needed. <coughs> Through my diabetes, which I've been diabetic now for just about 34 years, 20 of them I didn't play by the rules. I've, got, I've had family members tell me I've, made, I've broken every rule that there is for a diabetic, and I've probably made about a dozen more. Um, and all the time I was told, right from the time I was diagnosed to now, that I could lose my vision. And I always said, well, I'll worry about that problem when I get to it. Well, I, I, was, I said I'll accept it then. Well, that part was fine back then. But I lied. It was a hell of an acceptance. So with the help of the CNIB, after I started losing my vision, and my family doctor sending me to Dr. Chaudhry, I realized I had to let go and start reaching out and asking for help. Um, CNIB has been just awesome. Um, between from talking watches to talking clocks to CCTVs, um, instruction with the cane, um, talking to different the support group that the CNIB has is just unbelievable. Um, it was really a good eye opener for me because I'm not the only one with the vision loss. There's every, a lot of people out there, and with the support group, it made it that much easier for me to keep going. And then Dr. Chaudhry working on me. I swear to God, that when he first seen me, he probably thought, oh, not another hard keys. Um, but his care and his compassion that he shows to me and his willingness to work on me and my stubbornness is, I can't say enough. Um, I'm blessed to have him as my family doctor or I, specialist. I don't usually put a lot of faith in people putting needles in my eyes, but I'll go there any day. I'll walk over a rope of glass and let him do it. And he's kept the vision I've got now because of his care and compassion. And the five minutes I spend in his office each time I go there is a small price to pay for what I've got and what he's kept for me over the last seven years. Um, this, CNIB um, has really been grateful, for, uh, helpful for me with Bob, Susan, and Eleanor at the office. Um, they guided me and helped me along to, um, actually, I think Susan got tired of giving me canes and cane tips. Um, 
So if you suggested, or people in the office suggested I apply for a guide dog, and, and uh, I did that about a year ago, and I was very fortunate with the school I applied to accepting me real soon, or sooner than most people. And I received Larissa. Um, can't say enough about her. Um, if I had listened to the doctors 30 years ago, and <clears throat> did a little bit what they told me to do, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you all now. But I, I was so headstrong and stubborn, I guess is the biggest word, that I didn't want to listen to nobody. I was going to keep going the way I was going. And I tried. Every time they told me I couldn't do something, that was about the worst thing they all could tell me. Um, I think I went out of my way to prove to them I could. And it worked for a while. But uh, it doesn't work forever. If you want the help, it's there. Take it and use it. They're great people. And they're only there for your interest. And they want to be there for you. The support group is just unbelievable. Dr. Chaudhry in his office, the staff, um, they're a lot of fun. I actually yell and go in there and tell them jokes anytime, and they're great. Uh, and uh, his, his work and his dedication for our, myself and a lot of people is just unbelievable. I've called them when I've walked down the street told them I was having troubles, they'd have me come in right away, not make an appointment. There was no such thing as that word. So it, for me, it was, it, it, he's been a blessing. And I'm very grateful that he's in town here so I don't have to travel. And I know a lot of people have to travel to come and see him sometimes. That's a small price to pay for what he can give us. Glad to be here. It's an honor to be up here. Um, if it looked like I was a little nervous, you'd be right. Damn scared. Not much has scared me through my life, but this has. But I'm glad to be here. Um, the support that I've gotten from my friends, family, uh, CNIB, Dr. Chaudhry, everybody, it's just been great. And thanks for your time. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I wanted to thank Murray in particular right now, uh, as you can appreciate th uh, through what he had to say, it takes a lot of courage to get up here and comment candidly on the journey he's been on. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, we're going to have a Q&A right away after this, but if you can just, once that's over, and I'll give you a one question notice. Uh, we're going to have a, just a short presentation to our speakers, and then we'll draw for door prizes. Uh, but we're going to go right into the Q&A right now. One of the bottom lines to what you've heard here today is that this kind of team approach that Dr. Chaudhry mentioned in family practices, uh, the team approach that Dr. Chaudhry sends us clients that their significant vision loss, we have some of the things that can meet their challenges. Uh, with our partner organizations, and while we're not officially partnered, we do work together on these things, uh, the Diabetes Association and the CNIB. These are all potential solutions to the challenges you face. Certainly, uh, Dr. Chaudhry's there for detection, prevention, and treatment, and we're there for whatever your vision is today. That's what we work on. Those are the goals we try to address and we try to meet your needs as an individual. 
So uh, Alistair McLean, who I did not introduce earlier, who is one of the world's great drivers and is about as well known in southern Alberta as, uh, as Paul Brandt. Uh, Alistair will be going around with a microphone so your questions can be heard. Uh, I have a microphone here for the replies. Uh, I'll let you know when there's, we're down to sort of our final question and we will do the presentation and the door prizes, at which point on the exterior in the lobby, please take some time to stop into the booths, a, uh, the CNIB booths, the uh, Medicine Hat Public Library booth, and uh, Canadian Diabetes Association. I want to thank you for coming, but first, let's have some Q&A. Just, just put your hand up, we'll come to you with the mic. And don't be afraid. Uh, when doctor mentioned gluten, does that have to do with food? Gluten food? Um, no, I, I, today, I didn't mention gluten today. Oh, oh, is that? But you that's, that's a bit of a, um, a separate issue. Gluten actually is talked about a lot these days in terms of, that's celiac disease is what we're talking about. It has nothing to do with food. Uh, and, and gluten, no, gluten is in your food. So if you have a problem with gluten, you need to avoid certain kinds of food that have gluten in them. Does that pertain to what you just, what you said? No, no, not directly. Uh, now, having said that, actually, more and more people now are being diagnosed with uh, uh, gluten uh, um, sensitivity or, or celiac disease. It is also a bit of an autoimmune disease, so people with diabetes are a little more likely to have that. But it is different. It has nothing to do directly. By the way, um, Murray was not one of my more difficult patients. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's clear why it's so easy to work with Murray, uh, based on what, what he said. Hi, Dr. Chaudhary. Could you explain uh, the treatment of Lucentis for macular edema? Absolutely. Um, so I'll actually take it uh, to a step where I'd mentioned, you know, the body has, uh, the nature has a, a mechanism where it tries to fix the problem, and the, the fix to the problem is turning on a substance being produced in the eye, which causes a few things to happen. The key thing that happens with this substance, and it's got a big name, we'll, it's called vascular endothelial growth factor, we'll call it VEGF for short, uh, VEGF. Um, so this is the substance that uh, is produced in the eye. The idea is to undo or counter some of the damage that's happening because a lack of oxygenation, ischemia, lack of oxygenation from the diabetes uh, to the blood vessels. Now, when that substance is increased and when you measure it, it's, that substance is present in everyone's eye in a small level in an adult, but in diabetes, it is present in times, in, in many, many, many times higher amounts. Um, and what this substance does is it's kind of like um, a fertilizer, if you will, uh, for these new blood vessels, and it, it causes these new blood vessels to grow, uh, except they end up bleeding and causes all kinds of problems. The other side effect of this substance is it causes um, macular edema, leaking in the macula. We discussed um, where the macula was all swollen, and as a result, macular edema is one of the leading causes. In fact, it is the, I should say, leading reason why patients with diabetes lose vision as opposed to all of the other stuff, it's macular edema, it's fluid and uh, blood buildup in the center of the retina. That substance that, the, that, that gets turned up or in higher amounts in diabetic eyes causes more macular edema. Lucentis, this medication that Helen brought up, is a medication we use with those injections. We put in the back of the eye, in the vitreous, close to the problem where in the retina, and this substance causes, the, 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 the Lucentis causes uh, it blocks the substance, the vascular endothelial growth factor, and by blocking it, it causes to undo some of the bad effects uh, of the substance. So it treats macular edema, it treats um, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the, the new blood vessels growing. Incidentally, it, it's also we kind of we got lucky because this one substance treats both of those things. Those are the two main reasons why diabetes cause uh, causes people to lose vision. They have nothing directly to do one with the other. Macular edema is fluid buildup in the macula. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy is new blood vessels growing. Both of them, though, the main problem underlying them is the substance that 
um, that's there in the eye in, uh, in uh, much larger amounts than it needs to be. And Lucentis um, injections in the eye lower this substance, it blocks it, and thereby causing um, uh, vision to be improved by treating macular edema and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Some of that might have been unnecessarily technical, but it is interesting how it's all linked. I think it's probably important to mention uh, that Novartis, uh, Lucentis, is, their, is the supplier of that drug, and it's part of the reason they want this information out to you is for your benefit and for a greater understanding of that. It, Lucentis is used in other uh, eye conditions as well, Dr. Chaudhry? It is. It is. In fact, um, uh, the, the, the number one eye condition it's used in is macular degeneration, which is a separate condition, but, uh, uh, you know, in summary, wet macular degeneration causes new blood vessels to form not in the retina or on top of the retina like diabetes, but underneath the retina. So different technically, but the same idea, and Lucentis actually is the, um, the leading treatment for that condition. I had mentioned that diabetes is the leading cause of vision loss in people over the age of 75. Now it's more like over, uh, under, uh, or under the age of 75. It's more like under the age of 70. In people over that age, it's macular degeneration that's the leading cause. So Lucentis actually is the key treatment for that. I think we have a question over here. Yeah, my question is um, there, are opt <coughs> excuse me, there are optometrists out there and there are ophthalmologists out there. And is there a difference in the testing that either one does that's more beneficial, say, than the other? Well, you know, it's each one has its uh, ha, it has their rules, is the way I would put it. For initial screening, uh, we have to rely on optometrists. Optometrists are eye professionals, but they're not medical professionals. So um, they would do glasses, they would do contact lenses, they would do basic screening for eye conditions. Uh, some are more comfortable with some more involved medical involvement, others less so, but their training as such is not medical. They go to optometry school. Um, ophthalmologists are medical doctors. They've been through, uh, you know, a medical school. Then you subspecialize in different fields, and it's including surgery, and then they do, so they, they, they do treat the medical and surgical aspect of the eye. They do glasses and contacts too. Most ophthalmologists now don't, uh, just because there's too much medical stuff to be treated. Um, and again, once you get to be an ophthalmologist, you can choose to further subspecialize, and after the retina specialists come in, then, then you spend a little more time uh, further um, getting trained in to, to treat certain other specific things. But I think initial screening at the level of optometrists is crucial because there simply isn't enough ophthalmologists uh, to ever be able to, to do that. So you're an ophthalmologist? Ophthalmologist, right. I'd like to hear more about the side effects that you get from all this. And we were informed today. It's wonderful, but we didn't hear any of the uh, side effects. Of, uh, of treatment or of the, of diabetes? Uh, these, uh, these mm -hmm. We have to take that medicine for your eyes and you get uh, side effects from everything, every, Medicine. Sure, sure. Yes, absolutely. You know, what I, now that would be an extensive discussion that we would need to talk about, a specific medication to discuss side effects. But in general terms, I think it's a valid point. Um, everything has side effects, and it's kind of like one of those things, you know, my, my and I, it's partly jokingly, but, but I think it's, it's, on the other hand, it's serious. I, was, I had an extensive discussion with, with a patient one time about what's going on in treatment. It didn't involve diabetes. But, and at the end, of the, 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 the lady said, you know, and, and she meant it. She was, you know, she said, well, that's all nice because, you know, I know that you have to tell me some of these things. But really, in me, I'm not going to have any problems, right? And so the, the problem with that is, statistically, we have to be aware where every time you do something, there is a possible side effect to be considered. And that's the nature of not medicine, but that's the nature of life. My response to the lady was, well, no, I do mean in you there's a possibility of side effect. This is not just a general discussion. The way she phrased it was, uh, you know, there's no risk of anything going wrong. And my response was, well, there sure is. There is a risk of you're getting in an accident driving to my office. So how can there be no risk to a medical treatment? There is risk to anything. So the key is to balance the risk versus benefit. That's the key, right? And if you think that the that the problem is too small to warrant 
taking the risk of the treatment or the medication, then you don't and wait. At some point, if the scale tips over where it is worth doing the treatment and taking that risk because the problem is significant or severe enough, then you, then you go with the treatment. But you have to balance risk and benefit in every case, absolutely. Any more questions? Is there anything you can do in addition to regular screening and controlling your blood sugars to improve your um, prevention of eye damage? You know, uh, so very good question. Uh, there's things that are modifiable risk factors that you can control, which is what you're getting at. There's things you cannot control. Things you cannot control are uh, age, um, how long you've had diabetes, your genetics. Um, you know, some people have diabetes that's more severe than others. I mean, I, and, and this is kind of odd because I, some, you know, I have patients who sometimes will say, well, you know, I, I know someone who's had diabetes for 25 years, doesn't take care of it, you know, and, and still doesn't have any problems. Although some, sometimes you don't have a problem because you've never actually seen a doctor, and so, so you, haven't, you don't know you have a problem uh, yet. But you're right, it's like anything else in life. You can get away. Some people are just lucky. They have diabetes for decades, don't particularly take care of it, and don't have too much trouble. That's a very small percentage. In general terms, the better you take care of it, the better your chances. So, how long you've, the longer you've had diabetes, statistically, the more likely you are to have some of these issues, even if you take good care of it. The older you are, your genetics, these things you can't change. The ones you can change, don't smoke, sugar control, and by the way, I didn't specifically mention all the latest research, including one key study last year, points to seven or under seven as being the key number below which your risk of having, you know, uh, vision loss, blindness, kidney damage, heart damage, all of that significantly goes down. Now, I say that in general terms. I know there's some patients, you know, uh, Murray's a classic example. You know, Murray's not, he wasn't, in, there's no way you could be, he was gonna be in a position where he was gonna be under seven all the time. His diabetes was not like that. It was much more uh, uh, severe. Um, so you do the best you can, but no smoking, blood pressure control, um, sugar control, um, being active is huge. Um, watching your weight is huge. Um, and to some extent, then keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> it's, it's like anything else in life. I believe we've got a question for Murray up here. Yeah, I do. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Murray, to put you on the spot, uh, you thought you were finished. Uh, but in a, in a sentence or two, could you share a message that you would give to other people that have diabetes? Doctors and the dietitians didn't get doing 
that world. But the most important thing I'd like to say is this particular dietitian that knew the doctors of the monarchy of blood sugars, when I was diagnosed, there was no such a tool. Use it and use it to your advantage. And, and there's never ever a stupid question. Always ask questions. If you don't think the answer one person gave to you, try another one. Because that's all you that's all you can do is keep trying. And just don't give up. That rocking chair and window will wait another 15 years. Just don't quit. Keep asking and keep checking your blood sugar. But if you have anything, that's what I would say to you. Thank you. I'm not seeing a whole pile of further questions and the fact that we are uh, running out of time. I'd like to uh, have Susan uh, break some stuff up here. We'd like to present a small token of our gratitude to our speakers today.